Welcome back to the factory. This week, we have just received some brand new robots in the factory that we can't wait to commission and put to work doing some through-hole soldering. We're also working on a Makerverse digital to analog converter project. Let's do it. These shots are actually of a automatic through-hole soldering robot. And this is gonna be kind of a game changer for the factory's capabilities. Until now, we're doing single-sided load, surface mount only, which is, which is pretty normal. You know, if, if we can't pick and place it, it's out. But now with the capability to do through-hole soldering, we can bring into the mix like more user-friendly parts like bigger through-hole potentiometers or interesting connectors. So really excited to commission these robots. We'll keep you updated with what we learn along the way, and I'm sure we'll release some pretty drooly footage of them in action. In the last episode, we asked you what your favorite connector was for future dev boards, whether we stick with micro B or we go to USB-C. It's just, it was what USB was always meant to be. The votes are in and it seems like everyone is a fan of USB-C, much to our delight, because I, I was hoping on that one. Liam says that he loves the idea of USB-C, being able to pull enough current for motors through a USB connector. That's a pretty good point, actually. Paul chiming in that he really dislikes micro. And now that I've experienced USB-C, I'm inclined to agree with you, Paul. And Graham chiming in, USB-C for everything, please. So your votes are in, we'll proceed with that. In the last episode of The Factory, we were talking about this little Makerverse Class D amplifier. And you know, the obvious implementation for these is you know you connect your phone with, with a breakout lead that's wired directly into this, and you can play some audio over a speaker. That's really easy. But we thought, wouldn't it be nice to squeeze some audio right out of a Pico. Now a Raspberry Pi Pico is a purely digital device. It, it can only turn its pins on and off. It can read analog voltages, sure, but it can't create the analog voltages required to drive something like this. And so that means that we're gonna need a digital to analog converter or DAC. There's a large number of types of digital to analog converters available. You can get I squared C based modules off the shelf. You can get what's called I squared S modules, which are typically audio specific. Today, we're going to explore a simple type of DAC called an R2R ladder, which is just a bunch of resistors. So if you imagine this switch is currently connected to VCC and this switch is currently connected to ground, what we have here is a 2R resistance going to VCC. And if you go and do the very simple maths on these, this resistor network on the left here, we've got two 2Rs in parallel that both go to ground. So that's a resistance of R, that's in series with another resistance of R. So this whole thing is two times R. That basically means that we have a VCC, then a 2R, then a 2R going to ground, which is just a 50% voltage divider. So in this arrangement, we have this line of the output here where the output voltage this output voltage outside this um, op amp buffer is just half of VCC. The more complicated arrangement might be if this one is grounded and this one goes to VCC, um, we end up having a quarter of VCC on the V out pin here. Um, I'll leave you to think about that and convince yourself it's correct. And lastly, if they're both on VCC, we end up with three quarters of VCC. So this is basically just a binary counting where each step in our binary number gives us an extra quarter of the VCC at the output of our, of our op amp. So this is a two-bit digital to analog converter. Now this same pattern can be extended to as many bits as you want. And so the actual device that we're prototyping is a 10-bit digital to analog converter R2R ladder. This looks a lot more daunting and there's a few devils in the detail here, but it's basically the same thing, just extended out to more bits. So by extending out from two bits all the way out to 10, we get far finer control over what the output voltage is. In this case, we have 1,024 different levels that we could choose from. By having more bits and finer control of the output voltage, effectively we get less quantization noise in our output. In other words, it more accurately tracks an analog waveform that we might be trying to create. Yeah. So obviously you can buy DACs, maybe you've bought one, maybe it was just a little eight pin dip or something like that. Well, this has a few advantages. Um, one is that we can very easily synchronize this output to the sample rate of an audio file just using the Raspberry Pi Pico's PIO using something like an I2C DAC. It's actually quite difficult to get very precise timing on when the output changes. The other thing is that it's very simple. You know, comparatively, you can understand how this works a lot easier than you could understand how some commercial integrated DAC works. 
if you wanted to play with this in practical terms, you could just use a dip switch or some DuPont wires and just connect them up to the pins on this stack and see the output voltage change. But we've done a little bit of optimization or design for manufacturer on this one. And this design actually only requires a single value of resistor. So this resistor R here is exactly half of the resistor here that would go to one of the data pins. So we've just chucked two resistors in series. And it means, among other things, that we now have some resistance to systematic errors in the batches of resistors we get. If we happen to get a reel of 1K and a reel of 2K and the 2K resistors are all half a percent too big, doesn't matter because that half a percent systemic change is reflected in every single resistor. And the only thing that matters in this circuit is the ratio between the R and the two times R. Well, yeah, because it's the only the ratio between the R and the two R, there's actually a large selection of parts that we could draw from to actually build one of these things and have equal performance between different batches. So by only choosing a single value of resistor, it actually makes the design a lot simpler in terms of part sourcing. We only need to find one part that is plentiful and then we can use that for every resistor on this board. So in summary, where does this device fit? You've got I squared S stacks, which are audio specific. It's very difficult to just say, get them to output a DC voltage. You need to constantly stream the same number to them. We've got I squared C DACs, which are really great at creating DC voltages, but are very difficult to synchronize in some sort of audio application. And we've got this guy that we've come up with, which is going to be um, a usable signal to noise ratio, we hope, but can be synchronized with something like the PIO on the Raspberry Pi Pico, or you can just in your MicroPython code, dump a number to a bunch of GPIO pins and create a DC voltage. It's a very versatile part. So you might be thinking, why aren't R2R DACs just used everywhere if they're such fantastic devices? Well, there are a few very specific design challenges when we're trying to make something like this. For starters, the tolerance on the resistors you choose actually has to be really tight. We've made something where this least significant bit has an effect of one part in about 1024 on the output. And so the error on the most significant bit, the error in the value of those resistors needs to be 0.1%. And that's really starting to get a little bit niche. You know, 0.1% resistors are not something that everyone has floating around their workshop. If we're using 1K, the allowable error is one ohm. If you are familiar with the details of microcontroller GPIO pins, you'll actually know perhaps that uh, they've got some output resistance. You know, these two R's going into these data pins on a microcontroller can't assume that the 3.3 volts coming into this D0 pin, for example, has a source impedance of zero. The Raspberry Pi Pico source impedance on the GPIO pins is something in the range of 30 to 50 ohms. And so what that means is, we, is that we actually have to choose reasonably large values for these resistors so that that GPIO pin source resistance is insignificant, or at least within the 0.1% tolerance of the parts that we're trying to use. At the other end of the circuit, we've got some kind of load that this DAC is trying to drive. Now, if that load has some input impedance that's not very, very, very large, then that load is actually going to introduce an error into the output voltage. For the circuit we've got here, we're just choosing a non-inverting op-amp buffer. So this particular op-amp has an input impedance on that non-inverting pin, apparently of 10 to the power of 13 ohms. And that's kind of insane. It's significantly larger than the resistance of the FR4 circuit board between the two pins. So the input impedance of that op-amp is so high, it might as well be infinite, we don't really care. And that's great because it means that if we use very large resistors in our resistor ladder, they're not going to be affected. The output voltage is not going to be affected by having that op-amp there. So the last thing we're going to look at is just what the prototype model is. And here we are, we have all our, all our resistors and we have our op-amp on this little board. And down the side here, we've got a pin header that's going to be able to plug straight into the side of a Raspberry Pi Pico. We see it goes from GP6 to GP15, which just happens to be this lower left corner down here. So even though it's using a lot of GPIO pins, we still have access to say an SPI bus on the bottom right and an I squared C bus on different pins and the UART bus is not affected. So gonna use a lot of pins, but your Pico will still be very, very useful. So at this point, the prototype's being manufactured, the parts are in the mail, and as soon as that stuff arrives, we'll put one together and put it through its paces and see how it performs. First thing we'll probably do is throw a sine wave through this thing and use that to do detailed noise and distortion measurements to quantify its performance. So there you have it, a really bare bones but affordable implementation of a DAC that you can build during a silicon shortage. How good? 
If there's anything you'd like to see a little closer, or if you have some recommendations or questions, just let us know on the Core Electronics forums. We're full-time makers and we'll see you there. Until next time, thanks for watching.